Here we go. So the first, uh, the first thing I want to say, just to start with, is uh, a, a fair, um, a fair warning. Uh, in these new times where we have to work from home, the one thing that happens is that uh, our our personal life in, uh, invades your your private life. So I have a, a daughter. Um, it's nine months old now. And she's around somewhere over there, and uh, th there may be screams, there may be, sh you know, cries. So apologies in advance to this entire audience, um, because we may be interrupted by by that, and I'll try to avoid that from happening. I, I must, it to, to, I, I've alerted everyone that this session is happening. Hopefully, we won't be interrupted. Anyway, uh, just a point of note to say that um, I spent my day job doing, um, you know, in interacting with companies such as the ones that I am uh, uh, showing on this slide. Um, these are very, very large conglomerates, very large companies who are present across the world, north of 100 uh, countries, each one of them, with, with, with billions of dollars of business. And, and they're all, they have all embarked on the digital transformation. And I spend a lot of time with their CEOs, with their CMOs, helping them actually go through that digital transformation, as most of them have built brands on TV and, and traditional advertising are, and are moving into a world where they need to be present on Google search and they need to be present on YouTube and, and other platforms that we own. So this is basically what I do with my job today and more, more, than, more than happy to uh, talk about, more about that later on on the question, on the question sessions. But if you're gonna look at this from a logos perspective, um, my life or my career could also be defined by logos. So a lot of these logos you can identify with. Um, I was, of course, born and bred in Lisbon, uh, did my, start, started my education at Catolica, and, and then did an MBA much later on in, in, at INSEAD. And my trajectory was really with uh, uh, fast-moving consuming goods companies, started at PNG, went on to PepsiCo, took care of their fast food service in Brazil. Um, and then moved quickly to Portugal at the same time as my mom was uh, going through her last mile. Uh, that's when I embarked into the uh, creative agency world uh, with McCann, did a stint in Spain for a while, and then uh, went to the UK where I was taking care of some of their largest, um, largest uh, advertisers. Um, and by the way, when I was in Portugal for around six years, I worked at Sonai at that time at their ISP, Sonai.com. Um, as I said, then I moved to McCann, and then I went to the to the UK, where I was managing some of the largest uh, some of the largest global clients, such as Coca Cola, Mastercard, uh, for them globally. And then uh, that was when Google reached out to me and said, "Well, with your experience on managing very large uh, clients, such as those that I mentioned, uh, would you be able to help us figure out how to do that on our side?" And this is how I landed at Google. All right, so this is in a very in a nutshell how. Uh, my, my quick trajectory. Uh, the interesting question is how, how do, what are the learnings that I took away from it? And, and, and if anything, what, what kind of advice do I give to people that are trying to manage the trajectory of their careers? And the way I usually explain this is, you know, a career is like uh, when you have a boat and you're in Lisbon, you are about to sail uh, somewhere and you pretty much need to define where you're going to go north or you're gonna go south. There's, you know, you don't have to, when you're starting your career, you don't have to necessarily know where you're gonna go. You don't have necessarily to know that you're gonna land in, in uh, New York, or you're gonna land in Miami, or you're gonna land in the, in the Caribbean, or you're gonna land in Salvador de Bahia, or you're gonna land in Rio. You don't have to know that. You don't have to know if you're gonna stop in Cabo Verde, or if you're gonna stop in Madeira, or if you're gonna stop in the Bermudas. That's, that's not the point, but roughly you need to know where you're going to go. For me, um, when I was leaving Catolica, when I finished Catolica, I pretty much knew that I wanted to have, have something to do with marketing. And, and, because market, and marketing is a very, very large uh, area. Uh, you can go from creative to media, you can go from brand management to service management. I mean, there's, you can go to retail. You can, I mean, you can really try a lot of aspects. And did I know which one did I want to go? No, I did not know. But I roughly knew that I wanted to go to marketing and I did not want to go to consulting. Whilst a lot of friends of mine loved consulting and they really, really wanted to start with consulting. And this is where I find a difference between North and South. So you don't know really specifically uh, the, the, the area you want to go into, like in detail, but you roughly know where you want to go. 
a lot of my friends, as I was finishing school, really wanted to go into finance, uh, into banking. But, but, but just by saying banking, you can go from investment banking to retail banking, wealth management, corporate banking. I mean, there's all sorts of different areas. Uh, you can work for a central bank or you can um, uh, work for a retailer bank. You can, you can work on the consulting for, brand, for banks. Um, so, so the areas are tremendously large and you don't really know, but you sort of have a knack for something. And this is what I, my recommendation with people starting their careers is that choose basically your area, going north and going south. And by all means, as you are going into your trajectory, there are changes of, of mind, right? There's people who make adjustments within their area. They really, really thought they liked retail banking and actually found out that actually it's pretty bad and they hate it. And, but they really like corporate banking or they really like international banking or they really like you know, private equity management, which is close to finance. So, so as you, as you do your trajectory, you make adjustments in order to correct the course you're making and adjust and fine tune a little bit the model. Some people make massive changes, right? So some people start in finance and end up in marketing or, um, or, or vice versa, for instance. Um, but as this metaphor shows, it's really, really hard to make changes midway. It's not impossible and it has been done. And one of the key, um, Opportunities to do that is an MBA. An MBA is a really good opportunity to make big, big, big changes, big uh, switches. Um, but you don't have lots of those. And as you can see also from this metaphor, doing later that change means that you have a longer trajectory to make. So you know you need to be very aware as you go along what do you like, what do you don't like, and 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 make the respective um, respective adjustments. So. Learning number one, just for everyone to think about, is uh, look inside yourself. Look, look, look through the experience you had in university. Look at the, the the work that you had to do. I mean, lots of professors and teachers ask you to do lots of work in different industries for different topics. What were the things that really resonated with you? What are the things that really get you going? Um, this is more a, a piece of reflection at the intuitive level that you need to do. I mean, now you do, do you want to go more north or you want to go more south? so that you start really in the best way. And then as you develop your career, the second thing that I ask people to do is to really figure out what you guys are good at. And of course, early in your career, you don't know that as much. Although to be honest, when you finish school and you, you look at the last three years or the last five years, depending on, on whether we're talking about uh, the masters or not, um, you, you sort of kind of know the things you're very good at. You may not be very aware, and this does not mean great marks, right? Uh, great marks is you study a lot and you just get a great mark. But, but within that, you sort of kind of know intuitively the stuff that you're really, really good at, um, even better than others. What are the skills that you're particularly good at? Are you great at analysis? Are you great at conceptual thinking? Are you good at presenting in front of people? Are you good at creating teams and managing those teams through those uh, work groups that you have to develop. Are you a great conceptual thinker when you're writing a paper? I mean, where, wh what are, what are those skills that you feel that you really, really are very good at? And my recommendation is that throughout your career, throughout your experience, keep tabs on that. Keep asking you this question: What are the things you are very, very good at? And pretty much in the first year of your career, second year, first five years, first ten years, people will recognize you for certain areas which you're really, really good at. Feedback, you will receive tons of feedback on that and you will know that. But there's another area, which is the things that you absolutely love doing. And, you know, we usually love to do a lot of stuff. And I'm talking about at work, um, you know, there are, there are projects inside a company, there are areas inside a company, or as you progress in our career, there are specific projects that you really, really love, that it's your passion point. Keep tabs on that and, and get to know what you are very, very uh, good at, but also the, the, the things that you love doing. Because I, my argument is that your uh, career North Star, where you should point really all your energy and forces, is on that area that sits between what you are very good at and what, I, what you absolutely love doing. Now, let me tell you just an example that applies to me. So, I'm really good at operations. I can run really a good operation. You know, people, my job, you know, my, my bosses throughout years and years of careers tell me that I really run a great operation. Um, but it's something I don't love doing. So can I be a good COO? Can I be a good head of operations? Absolutely. 
Do I love doing that? I don't really, don't really. I know I'm good at it, but I don't love doing it. Uh, one thing I love doing is singing, <laughs> but uh, do I make that my career? Probably not. So maybe I should continue to sing in my shower, which, you know, no one can listen to me most of the time. And, and that's pretty much where I should stay. What, what really, really matters is where you coincide both. What are the things you are incredibly good at and what are the things you absolutely love doing? Right? So I absolutely adore to gather a team to crack a difficult project. And I know I'm really good at getting a complex problem broken down in really simple pieces, put it together and find a solution and drive a team to find a solution. This is something that I can do no matter what the industry, no matter what situation. It's, it's a very peculiar skill that I have that I absolutely adore doing, and, but I'm really good at, at doing as well. And what I can tell you is that people that you admire, people that you feel that have great success, very well-known uh, politicians, very well-known um, uh, CEOs and CMOs, very well-known and successful artists, they are always working in this middle. They continue to insist on what they're good at and they absolutely love what they do. If you look at presidents, prime ministers, when you look at the, the goods and the bad ones, right? So um, when you look at Obama and Trump, I mean, those are so different. And yet um, they absolutely are amazing at what they do and they absolutely love doing it. We may not like what, what one of them is doing, but the reality is they, you know, when they wake up in the morning, they pretty much know that they're good at what they're doing and they absolutely get a lot of energy of doing it. And this is true for Lady Gaga, as well as it is for Beyonce, as well as it is for some of the biggest CEOs in the world, Richard Branson. I mean, you can see the love that he has for, um, for Virgin, and he's really good at building those businesses as we've seen over the years. So throughout your career, you need to keep tabs of these two circles and figuring out exactly what are the very little moments that coincide between what you love doing and, uh, and what you're good at. Now, Throughout your career, what you can do is enlarge this, this uh, surface. And you, the way you do it is by, um, through experiences. So as you are uh, in a certain position, in certain department, you can look around and see other departments next to you. You can look around at other companies. You can, and use your own position to experiment with other areas and see whether you like it or not. So for instance, when I was a brand manager at P&G, I really thought I loved television production. I thought it was amazing, an amazing industry. I was in marketing. Uh, selling shampoos, but 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 what I loved, I, I looked at it and said, I think I love TV production overall. And I was in, you know, I was in love with um, uh, with seeing TV stations working at that time and how production was done. So I used my job to actually experiment a lot with that, and 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 I started leading a couple of projects within my brand to try to engage more with TV stations and production companies to really understand how they operated. And I did a few projects like that, only to find out that actually I did not like it. So looking from the outside looked really, really interesting. Once I was doing it inside, it was really bad. And I decided not to get myself into the TV production at all and direct again my energy into something else. And so this way, it's a way for you to experiment within the job and, and find out, fine tune this model to really understand what are you good at and what are, um, and what are things you love to. So this is the, what I call the career north start, but there's a third circle that has to come here. And that's what I call the personal circle. All of that is very fine, but then you have to answer the question of what are you gonna do with your personal life? What do you wanna do with the time uh, that, that you have after you leave the office? Remember the time when there were offices? So, so what do you do with that time? We, where, where do you wanna live? Uh, do you wanna get married? Do you wanna have family? Where do you have to have the family? Who do you want that family to, how do you want that family to grow? Um, what kind of values do you, have, do you want to have around? Um, so, and this is, this is a really important part because managing a career uh, involves other people more than you. You're not alone managing your career. In fact, when you're managing your career, you have to bring a lot of people with you. You have to bring your wife or your husband, you have to bring your, your children. And by the way, you have to involve your parents and your loved ones anyway in your decision because they are the ones that are gonna be away from you etc. Cetera, et cetera. And this is even more important when we're talking about building a global uh, uh, career, which is the title of this, um, of this seminar today. So, so when you're building a global career, these are the things you have to think about, which means that you know, your personal plans can give you more options or less options depending on what, you, what, I, what I call the kitchen conversation. You need to bring your loved ones, the ones that you share your life with, and have what I call a kitchen conversation. You have that conversation about, okay, 
how are we as a family going to do this? And by the way, sometimes it's not you driving the career choices. Sometimes it's the person you, you share your life with that has to drive the, those career choices. Maybe you have to go and follow someone else instead of you driving it. No matter what, your kitchen, the kitchen conversation has to be had. Because the moment you say yes to a company and you want to move because you're on a global career and you want to move countries, you're going to bring everyone with you. And by the way, what, even if you're moving into a very exciting city or a country, it's always hard. It's always incredibly hard to adapt to that city and that country. It's incredibly hard to adapt to the school systems, to find a job for your wife or your husband. It's incredibly, incredibly hard. And so this has to be a joint uh, decision in order to be successful. Which means that truly, truly the North Star, it's that uh, incredibly precious uh, area that matches what you're good at, what you love doing, and what your loved ones that you're building a life with are prepared to do together with you. Because that limits. And you, I have lots of conversations with people that say, Pedro, I would love to work with you and your team. I would love to have international exposure, but but I have to be close to my parents because my father is, has a horrible cancer and for the next five years, I cannot, you know, I want to stay next to, to him. So you cannot, you know, these are the moments where you have to make really difficult choices. You cannot really have an international career if you're grounded in a city because you, you, you want to be close to your father. And I would say that maybe, maybe that is the most important thing you have to do. And, and these are the hard choices you have to make. I had another example of a guy who was reporting to me and, and he said, look, my father has this huge company and I'm expected 10 years from now to take over from that company. So I need to be close. I need to be operating sooner or later. I need to be operating in that country. In this case was India. Um, so that I'm, you know, 10 years from now, I can take over from the business. Okay. Well, so that personal plan is incredibly important because instead of sending that person to New York, as I was going to send, I sent him to our office in Delhi because I knew it was important for him to start getting ready to take over the business from his father. So I hope this gives you a sense of, of how this model really works. And the, the next thing I would say is career choices cannot be made over time. So I'm, so I'm sorry, overnight. So a lot of people come to me and say, hey, I'd like to move to something new by the end of the year. So this is not the way to approach things, right? So uh, you cannot really make career choices and big swings in periods of months because no company has the ability to absorb that and and because those things have to be planned and and you have to be specific as well on what where you want to go and where you want to go next right what i would say is as you are doing your your as you as you're managing your career and going towards the north which is what in this case you decided to do what you have to do is every one oops, sorry every once in a while you have to keep tabs on on the progress you're making make adjustments is this what i expected I mean, I had a certain expectations. I really love this area, but I'm not sure this is the right thing to do. Do I have to adjust again? Do I have to make adjustments? Do I have to consider something else? Can I experiment something on the side? And, and also life happens to you, right? You fall in love with someone, changes, you divorce, you, you are approached by a headhunter and change dramatically where you are. So things happen in life. Life is complicated and, and, and messy. So you have to keep tabs of, of, of things every year, every six months, de debate it with someone to help you think and, and, and make the, the necessary adjustments as you learn more about yourself. Which leads me to the next point, which is, you know, seek advice. Don't make this thing on your own. Um, and this is, this is usually the funny, the funny dilemma that I usually uh, ask uh, audiences to help me figure out. If you want to go with a boat from Lisbon to, uh, Canada where, you know, you, and you need to seek advice, which of these two people would you seek advice? The gorgeous man on the left or the seasoned, uh, uh sea wolf on the right. And, and as much as uh, some people in this audience, maybe would uh, rather have a beer with a person on the left. We all agree that if we want to make that big, big uh, movement, if we want to cross the boat from Lisbon to the north of Canada and, you know, drive through the North Atlantic, chances are we would choose the right one. Um, having a mentor, usually with a gray hair, is a good thing because a mentor uh, gives you a sense of not only career, but also life. It helps you make decisions and manage through dilemmas uh, in a much, much more experienced way. So one of my strong recommendations is, you know, find people with gray hair, choose one or two people that you really admire. They don't have to work necessarily in the industry you do, but, but you need to admire them in the way they manage their career and their lives, their personal lives. 
and you know ask them to mentor you. Um, usually when people are asked, usually they say yes. And go and check with these people once a month. I'm sorry, not once a month, please don't do that. Uh, once a year, once every two years, once every five years, um, you always learn something. And I have two or three really old um, uh, men and women who uh, have helped me through my career all the time. And I go back to all the time just to check my options, which again are usually a mixture of uh, professional and personal. So just to recap, Remember, to, you know, answer the question, are you going north or south? Do a little bit of homework and find out what you really, really love and, and, and find your north side. Test the boundaries of, of, of and collecting intentional experiences to really enlarge that area that I was talking about. Have those kitchen conversations to really figure out where truly is your true north star because you have to share that option with other people. Uh, being the other people, the people you're married to, or your friends, or your parents, or your grandparents. Uh, don't rush in your decisions. No, one, no one's going to lose anything if you wait six months to make a decision. Um, readjust the coordinates every year, you know, reflect on it. Uh, New Year's Eve's are usually very good for this. And then choose gray hair, preferably as uh, mentors. And more importantly, don't, don't stress about it. Just relax about it. People really a lot of times think that a decision has to be made in a year, or it has to be made in... Uh, immediately otherwise they're going to lose the train there's no lose there's no train losing um, in terms of careers uh, because lots of trains go through your station you just have to think carefully about your options and when the time is right you, you, you can you can make it appropriately um, I was going to do some considerations about COVID and the impact it has on careers as well as other considerations but what I suggest we do is we stop here and we pause here and then we move to the conversation with Felipe and eventually answer some questions. Um, so let me just stop uh, presenting. Yeah, I'm back here, I guess. Can you guys see me? All good? Yes, we yeah. can. Thank you, cool. Pedro. Thank you very much for sharing your insights and then some of your personal journey and reflections. Um, you work for one of the most admired and one of the most innovative companies in the world. Um, I actually, uh, let me share a bit of a personal story. I feel uh, uh, a bit of a connection to Google because when I joined Stanford for my PhD that was September 1998 and that was exactly the month in which Google was founded by two PhD nerds at the Stanford campus and I still remember in my first two years of PhD seeing some nerdy guys wearing a Google t-shirt and we asked what is this Google thing oh it is like the latest kind of cool startup created from Stanford and going from two PhD nerds uh, doing a little kind of uh, around an idea, a bit of programming, to having one of the biggest, uh, most important and most admired innovative company in the world. It was like 12 years. That is truly amazing. And that speaks to the power of entrepreneurship, uh, the power of uh, academia as well. And when you merge the two together, the beautiful things that can emerge. But, uh, and we hear a lot of folklore about what makes Google interesting and special. But you have the inside view. You have been in a leading position at Google for, for several years now. So what do you think makes Google so special and so innovative? And in particular, you manage within Google the creative team called Zoo, uh, a task force, a creative team that launches new ideas, new products. So what does it mean to, to coordinate the most innovative uh, team in the most innovative company? Yeah, so... Um, so what what you know so there are two things so so what makes it so special is um the fact that it's incredibly innovative but also the people that work at google um you one of the things you that happens to you when you join google is you suffer i suffered significantly for something called imposter syndrome if you don't know what imposter syndrome is please google it i appreciate the search <laughs> As far as I'm concerned, I appreciate you use the service, but um, imposter syndrome and, and a very significant, a very significant amount of executives at Google suffer from imposter syndrome. But effectively, what it is is you feel that you're not worth the you're, you're not as smart as everyone else around you. Um, uh, Google has hires incredibly smart people, so you are frequently in in meetings uh, with people that you look around and you're like, it's it's just a crazy, it's just it's a crazy experience in that sense. Um, and so, and it takes a while for you to go over your imposter syndrome because you feel that whatever you're going to say is not going to be good enough and because <laughs> everyone is so uber smart um, and so, so amazing. So the people is what make it really, really special. But the innovation culture 
um, or, or the fact that it's an incredibly innovative company, it's driven by three elements essentially. The first one is um, uh, that Google believes in, in, in impact. We only think about something we call 10x thinking. If you think about the mission of Google, literally it says, and in 1998, the, the year you're mentioning was when Larry literally called in the investors and said, hey, so I'm putting together, it is, there's a video of this, so I have the video, and it's, it's just crazy because they, they, um, he calls investors and says, okay, so we're putting together a, a company that is going to organize in the, the world's information in, the, in an accessible and useful ways. I mean, like literally. So in 98, you were saying you're going to organize the world's information. And so this is crazy. Um, and, and this is what we call 10x thinking. So we, the one thing that you are indoctrinated the moment you join Google is, look, if you're going to do something, you better have impact. You better touch billions of people. You better fix a huge problem. So we don't believe in incrementality. We don't believe in, in, in adjusting 5%. So, so for instance, when we were looking at our energy consumption, we said, either we're going to go footprint negative or we may as well just not do it. So Google now is, our, our carbon footprint is negative uh, because we just decided all of a sudden just to do that. And, and this is the kind of approach to it is just, if you're going to do something, you might as well just do it big. And that's what we call this 10 X thinking. Um, we also are a culture that celebrates failure, which is really, really interesting. So what we do is we launch and, and iterate permanently. And, and a way to understand this well is to compare with Apple. Apple is the opposite of us. And by the way, Apple is a phenomenal company, an extraordinary company, but they are on the polar opposite in this sense. Apple only launches things when they are absolutely gorgeous and perfect, right? So your experience when you, when you grab Apple, uh, Apple product is just, it's this explosion of beauty, um, this incredibly well-crafted, well-designed, well-marketed product. Um, when they do a glitch, they are profoundly apologetic, right? So every time a app didn't work or every time they had a problem with the memory of a phone, they put together a press release, they apologize profusely, someone gets fired. I mean, for them, failure is really, really bad. And look at that. I mean, they built a phenomenal company. But from a cultural value standpoint, we're the opposite, right? So what we do is just launch something and then, you know, it's sort of buggy and so, so, sort of sort of works in 90% of the cases, but then we improve as we go along and, and we keep iterating and, and then we remove products. I mean, we keep taking down products that we launch all the time. You rarely, you rarely remember Apple taking down a product, right? That they launch. We, we do this all the time uh, because we believe in putting out there launch into the masses, get everyone to use it, learn with the usage, and then improve it as we go along. So it's just a very different philosophy. And the third part is openness. We, we basically believe that everyone has to be part of the development. So we are not like a closed environment where we go into a lab, close the doors and do everything and then launch. We usually launch platforms and then everyone collaborates on it. So think about Android, which is the largest mobile platform in the world. It's really built by us, but it's really built by us with a ton of, it's open, open source C and, and everyone collaborates on it and everyone builds on it. And Android is really a product of what Google did together with the entire partner ecosystem. So these are the three characteristics that make us slightly different than other companies and ensure that we are very innovative. Great, thank you, Pedro. Uh, let's speak just a bit about the COVID pandemic and how it has changed the work and the, uh, and the life at Google. And I think a lot because you are there in beautiful Portugal uh, doing this, this digital conference while working for Google. Um, but so most companies that are based in knowledge work and, and Catholic Lisbon included, shifted a lot to uh, teleworking, to remote working. Um, do you feel that it's working well for Google? Are you planning to return physically to work or, or not so soon? And also, you that coordinate across teams and, 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 and areas, what have you learned about do's and don'ts in terms of managing and leading remote teams in a completely yeah. remote environment? So we, we were one of the first uh, companies during COVID. We were the first companies to actually send people home uh, well ahead of most people um, because we were incredibly concerned about the well-being of our, um, of our uh, employees. But more importantly, because we had already designed a system that allows for working from home. 
if people, you know, people that read about Google know that we are incredibly flexible when it comes to to work to working uh, methods. We we actually it's part of our culture to incentivize people to work from home every once in a while. Now, it doesn't mean three months in, in a row, but we it, it's normal for my teams. It's normal for any team to stay at home on Monday or 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 don't don't go to work on Fridays or take. Uh, Wednesday and stay at home uh, midday or you know so working flexibly has always been part of the culture so it was a lot easier for us to start to move it um, to move directly to work from home but we were the first ones one of the first ones to go and I suspect we're going to be one of the last ones to allow people to go back to work um, because we believe that the conditions you have to create in order to make it safe is, incre is incredibly hard and the experience that you're going to have at the office is not going to be what it used to be before Right. So, so, um, so I think it's got, we're going to take a while. Um, officially, we've let everyone know that they should plan to work from home until at the end of December this year. And we're going to revise then the, uh, depending on the second wave, depends on a lot of other things. We will revise our target, um, uh, I would say by November uh, on what we're going to do. Um, In terms of your managing virtual teams. Yeah. So what I would say about that is, um, what working, what, you know, working from home, what it allowed, forcing a lot of companies to work from home, what it did was to bust once and for all this connection between productivity and presence, which was something that it was present in most companies around the world. It was, or in a lot of traditional companies, right? So you need to be present. You need to go to the office in order for your product productivity to be acknowledged. And what, um, and what we're moving into is one where, you know, productivity equals, impact so you need to what you need to do is to agree on your objectives what do you expect from each person to deliver and you need to trust that that believer, that person is going to deliver it doesn't matter how to how it delivers it doesn't matter which hours of the day or the morning uh, they decide or the evening they decide to work what you what, what you have to agree is on the deliverables and this is pretty much how uh, i'm managing my teams i have teams in the us i have teams in europe i have teams in in asia and pretty much this is how I manage the teams. We, we just agree on what are the deliverables for, for we, ne we negotiate this, we, we do this contracting for the quarter. We say that for what you do, these are the things I expect from you this, this, this quarter. And it's just, and then you deliver depending on your uh, capacity and your ability. And, and that is a much more healthier um, relationship. I think the bonds of trust between employees and employers will be, uh, revisit it during this period because you, now you have to trust people. <laughs> That's the only thing you can do. You have to trust people and you're going to have a lot a, a, a much more intelligent conversation with people, which is going to be about the deliverables that they have to do. And you don't have to worry so much about how they're going to do it. Who cares if someone works eight hours or only works three hours, if someone is able to deliver what they have to do in three hours and spend the rest of the time in the swimming pool, what do I care? <laughs> like what, you know, if, if the objectives are, are delivered, good for him or her and she is incredibly productive great um so this is pretty much how i'm managing the teams and and this is how i think they actually the entire industry is moving great uh just i'd like to learn a bit more about your role because your role involves the the global relation with some of the major clients of google uh yeah. some of the largest companies in the world so it's very much a, a b2b uh, kind of uh, relations and, and sales mode um, you help them engage with their clients, but you engage them in a, in a B2B mindset. And I think we, we know a lot more about consumer marketing and B2C, and we teach more about that than sometimes we, we understand the mechanics and the insight of how to do a great B2B sales and relationship management role. Are there any things that you've learned that are particularly effective in, in the B2B world, in, in selling and building relations in the B2B? Yeah, so I, so I have two teams, right? So I have the team that handles those clients that I've shown at the beginning. Um, and we ha I have teams exclusive for each one of those guys. And then I have the innovation team that you mentioned before, which you know drives the most innovative projects we do with some of those, uh, some of those clients. So they are sort of separate. But I would say that what we do is B2B to C in the sense that, as you say, you are used to uh, teach, you are used to usually look at marketing as a B2C exercise. Well, that B2C exercise used to be like you ship a product and then you basically do advertising and marketing to make that product uh, fly, right? To sell. 
Um, and the only thing that is happening is that the media consumption has changed around the world. And therefore now, if you want to launch a lipstick, a car, a bag, a brand, a shampoo, a deodorant, a yogurt, you cannot just go on television anymore because no one's watching. So the big question is how do big brands now launch their news? How do we establish their relationship with consumers uh, now that no one's watching television? You used to interrupt their lives with, they were watching a piece of news or TV series and you would interrupt them and, and show them something. That's gone. So how do you find, how do you build now a brand when that is not happening? So we teach them, we, we are basically what we're doing with those very large clients, we teach them to do that, to make that transition and to get ready and being really, really good at making that transition. Yeah. And with the other team, the Zoom team, the, the creative team? Yeah, so the Zoom team is then, then sometimes clients come to us, those clients come to us with really complicated uh, problems, right? So they want to launch a product simultaneously in, 50 countries and they want to do a live stream on YouTube that goes through satellite and can be picked up on maps where you launch an app that connects to them, you know, and, and so it's typically really complicated, um, uh, uh, technology solutions for problems that they have. And I apply, I, I don't have normal creatives. I have what I call creative technologists who basically look at the business problem that these customers have and find a technology solution for what they're trying to, to, uh, to work out and that technology solution, of course, within uh, the product suite of Google. I mean, I'm not going to find a technology solution at Facebook. <laughs> so, um, and and that's what they mostly do. Okay. You have a, a dream job, I do that to describe it. It's very, very interesting. I have maybe one final question on my side and then I'll open up to some of the, uh, the participants' questions. Uh, and the final also speaks about some of our younger generations, some of our students, some of our graduates. Um, we typically say that the new, the new generations, compare maybe to, to our generation, we are about the same generation, are much more purpose driven in the sense that they, they, they don't want to delay the purpose of their life. They want, as you say, to match their passions, what they like to do with their career, but not only their passions at a deeper level, they want to have a sense of purpose in the career and the company they work for. Uh, do you feel this change in the newer generation the last five years compared to 10 or 15 years ago. How does a company like Google respond to this deep desire for purpose? That's the, the graduates, the new uh, people entering the job market are now revealing. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you that the, uh, the new workforce is, uh, purpose is very much uh, at the core of what they look for. Um, it's incredibly important for them. Um, and I absolutely agree that Back in my time, purpose was not in the he was not in the consideration set at all. These were other times, um, and and I and and this is new, and I'm really glad that this is this happens as well. And what I would say is my my advice would be for uh, students to really understand what is the purpose that they're looking for, um, what what is the purpose that resonates with them, and use that as criteria to select the companies they want to work on, right, or they want to work for. Um, because if they don't check the purpose, um, they will be disappointed later on. And that is a massive source of frustration. So my recommendation is know yourself really well. If you want to embrace a purpose, understand which purposes it is and choose companies that embrace the same purpose as you, as you have, uh, and purposes come in all different shapes and forms, and you don't have to necessarily end the hunger in Africa or have to save the planet. I mean, there's, it comes in all different shapes. Um, and, and what I would, what I would say is that it's important for, uh, students to know what their value set is, what are the values they want to ad adhere to and check with the companies if the values of the company match their own personal values. Uh, one of the biggest pre COVID, one of the biggest, uh, uh, reasons for, for attrition, people leaving companies is because there is a disconnect between their personal values and the values of the company. So before you embark on a career, please check the values of the company you're going into um, because that is a huge motivator. Pedro, let me make a, uh, a selection uh, of the questions that have been raised by our, our participants in this conference sure. um, and also pick the ones more closer to the topic of careers. And uh, Jose Eduardo Passarelli uh, is asking, what are the main differences between North and South in your opinion? 
And I think this may be related to the idea of if you uh, potentially, when we speak about the global north or global south, do we want to start your career, let's say, in a developed country in the UK or in, uh, in the US? Do you want to start in the south, potentially, in a developing country with a lot of maybe opportunities, but a different culture? So as you are managing or planning your career, do you see any, and you've worked in, in the south and the north already. So how do you see the difference between those two different regions and, and where would you say people should start? Well, I would say, I would say to flip it two things. I, I'm, I'm not sure that's the question. So let me, let me answer your question and let me ask you what I think the question is. Yeah. <laughs> so I think the question is picking up on my analogy of North and South as big areas, right? And what yeah. I, what I would say is the big difference is what you find from a differences is, you know, the language that people use is really the language you should use. Um, are you a numbers guy? Are you an analysis guy? Are you an extrovert or an introvert? Are you passionate about people? Or are you passionate about systems? Do you want to, are you an engineering kind of guy? Do you, do you like, do you like process flows or do you like, do you like think strategically about conceptual stuff or do you, do you actually like execution and you want to be in the, in the front line, talking to people or talking to products. This is the kind of thinking, these are the kind of areas. And I know it sounds very fluffy, but honestly, it's really what matters, right? Because then what you have is, as I've had several times, friends of mine who are working for big consulting companies telling me, I feel so, so far away from reality. I feel so far away from, from real impact in people's lives. And I'm like, yeah, because you chose consulting. What did you expect? I mean, th th these guys are conceptual thinkers. They are not on the street making things happen, right? So if you wanted that, you chose the wrong pattern. Um, equally, I have people that have chosen consulting and are happy as a clam and love the work that they do because they are conceptual thinkers and they want to continue to be conceptual thinkers and we need conceptual thinkers and vice versa. Uh, I have people that, you know, accept jobs that are incredibly operationally driven. They are very close to the field reality and they feel very tactic. They don't like the gruesome day-to-day -day pressure and they complain about that and they feel that they don't have strategic input to that. Well, you know, you chose to be on the sales force of a retailer. What do you expect? <laughs> this is exactly how it feels. So this is what I'm saying. So you need to have a sense of, you have to do a big journey inside of yourself to find out really what is this, what's the kind of stuff that you really, really like um, and look for it. And then look the companies and industries and areas that, uh, that you know, match and, and offer that kind of job. So that, I think it was the question, but the yeah. your question, <laughs> um, I think, you know, um, it, it's a question of, of schooling. Um, if, you, if you choose the North, the, the North hemisphere uh, uh, to develop your career, you're gonna go into areas where you're gonna learn more than what you're gonna take. If you go to the developing countries, usually, you're going to learn conceptually less, but you're going to learn more about life and, and about, uh, um, so, so the North is less about life and more about conceptual thinking. The South, the South is more about life and less about conceptual thinking. Right? It's the, the South is more creative. You need to find out solutions quickly. You need to come up with, um, manage uncertainty and ambiguity a lot more uh, because the South tends to be a bit messier. And these are all stereotypes, very dangerous, but you understand the point. Whilst the North is a lot more dogmatic, a lot more structured, a lot more conceptual. So again, it depends on, on what really triggers you and what you like the most, right? Um, um, and some people, I mean, go to Brazil to have a career and they find it the most frustrating thing in the world. And, uh, and other people, dear friends of mine, go to Brazil and they blossom like that. And the same thing happens in the U.S. People go to the U.S. and they cannot wait to come back quickly and others go to the U.S. and never want to come back. So, so it really, again, depends on spending a lot of time getting to know yourself. No investment is better than really understanding who you are to really place you and, and, and put you in front of the challenge that will develop you the most. Thank you, Pedro. There was another question about, you spoke about the importance of having mentors and having mentors that follow and support throughout your career. Um, and um, a question from, from Pedro actually is about uh, how do you create these mentoring relations and you make them more formal where there's a common understanding they are a formal mentor with a regular schedule of conversations every six months, for example, or are they informally people that you connect to 
And by the way, at, uh, at Catholica, we have a, a nice system where each undergraduate student that arrives is paired with an alumnus as a mentor. So we build some of these formal mentoring relations from the start. But as you engage with them throughout your career, uh, would you recommend to formalize it a bit more, to informally, and how do you identify and select some of these great mentors? Yeah, so um, you, um, you, know, you know you have a great mentor the moment you look at it. You mom, the moment you see him or her perform in front of you. Um, and you know that's someone you want to learn from. I mean, you just know. Um, I have two, my earliest mentors, I have two in this call, uh, Fatima and Christina were really important in my career uh, with, with small conversations we had here and there. They fundamentally changed the course of my life. They don't even probably realize that, but, but, but these were people I saw operating. I saw them on stage. I saw them performing and I said, I think I have something that I can learn from these people. And, and spending some informal time with them was just the way initially when I really was at the start of my career was the best way to start. Of course, then you, you, you go into the next levels and, and then you start looking for uh, other um, mentors to, to find answers to the questions you have and to your question of, do you make it structural? I think the, the, the more you progress in your career, the more you, you have to make it formal because to make, to make the most out of your mentor, you actually need to structure the approach to that mentor you cannot just go in and say hey you know what can you tell me about my career <laughs> that's a really waste of the mentor's time and yours um, you need to do deep thinking you need to consider really really well what are your choices what are your dilemmas and by the way the mentor is not going to give you the answer and it's not a good, more importantly it's not going to choose for you but what that person is going to tell you is okay well if those are the dilemmas number one he will he or she will challenge your questions and number two, he or she will say, well, these are the pros and cons that I see on what you're considering. Uh, up to you to figure out how, how to do it. Um, one of the most frustrating engagements I had as a mentor to other people is when they come and talk to me without any structure whatsoever. They just want to, to chat or something. And that doesn't really, really work. Uh, great mentees who have had great results are the ones who actually spend a lot of time thinking about their dilemmas, their choices, their direction. Um, they come prepared. Sometimes they even do presentations about their lives, which is incredible. Um, and, and they want to present. And then, and then we have a conversation based on deep thinking, which is typically where you see more results. I hope this answered the question. Yeah, thank you. So let me finish with a, with a question that is interesting because it's a bit different from what we discussed before. We are speaking about how to start a career, how to plan your career. And Carlos Gomes ask, asks, well, but how about the closing of your career? When, you, when you, we are 50 year, years old or 60 years old, you have 40 years or maybe 35 years of a career already, but you still have good health, you still have energy to do things. What do you do? Do you, uh, and maybe you are kind of cl getting close to that moment where you think about, do I continue at Google five or 10 more years of these or do I change or who, how, how do I think about like the next stage of my career? And I know a few people in the audience, we also, this was catered to the younger, the alumni, the incoming students, uh, but we have also some people exactly at that stage uh, of our life. And I'm looking at a couple of, uh, of them in the screen. How do you think about that? And uh, we're still a bit young, maybe to reflect on that, but I, I wanted to close with that question because... I mean, I cannot answer with my 25 years old. I cannot, as a 25 year old, I cannot think about how to answer that, but I'm going to try. Um, <laughs> um, I, you know, um, first of all, the methodology that I presented does change. It's the same. Um, the thing is you are about to get to Canada. So you need to figure out what are you going to do once you land in Canada, right? So, or what you do, what you do once you land in Paris, um, I'm sorry, in Brazil. Um, so, so it doesn't really, really fundamentally change. You still need more than ever to focus on, but by the way, by the time you get 50, 60, if you don't know what you're very good at and you don't know what you love, you should, you know, you should look for therapy. I, you know, it, I, I don't, I don't know what to say. Right. So, so by the time, you have to know what you're very good at and you have to know what uh, you're passionate about. 
And the outlets for that may be different. So it won't be probably the regular career top executive, whatever, but it's probably other formats. You can uh, join boards of companies. You can uh, join the boards of startups. You can start teaching again and go back to university. You, be, you can become, you can do lectures and presentations. You can land all your, your, your uh, write a book. You can, you can give that experience and sell that experience um, in other, other ways. Uh, the method is the same, it's just the delivery type is different. The one thing you don't have to do by that time is to search inside yourself. You should know by then the stuff that you're good at and the stuff that you love doing. Pedro, thank you. It's, it, it's six o'clock, so I don't want to delay everyone much longer. But I, I would like to give you a chance to say a final word in the sense, uh, especially now maybe to our younger crowd, the, the alumni, the, so the students of Catholica who are graduating this year or next year, the incoming, incoming students who will be graduating next year, maybe they will be graduating to a tough job market and they will be launching their career in a difficult context. What would you tell them? What words have encouraged them or wisdom or in addition to what you've shared already, what would you, what would you say to them? Uh, look, it's, it's incredibly hard um, uh, for sure. Um, but what I would say is um, uh, this. Uh, just because what I would do is work on work on your CV. You're starting your CV, you're starting your life, but that doesn't mean that you don't have a story to tell. You've made a journey so far. I mean, you made choices about the, the, the course you wanted to take or the masters you want to take. You have something to prove already of the experience that you had. If you have to wait another year to find the job, use that year the best you can. Because when you're uh, talking about your career, you, you effectively are telling your story. And the way you should write a story is, hey, COVID may have stopped the economy, but it has not stopped me. And this is what I did with the time that I had. I helped an NGO. I organized the back end of an organization. I helped my mom with, uh, you know, I helped my mom restart the restaurant that belongs to the family. I put the finances of my grandfather together. I paid all the taxes for the family that were in disarray. I've I've worked on finding new skills, spent time online, and now I can speak Russian or Chinese. But what you need to do is to go back to the employer and say, this is where I spent my time. This is where I invested this time. It did not go to waste. Um, and it's still building. I, I kept building on the, the skills that I set out with. Um, and, and then, the, look, the economy is going to come back for sure. And the jobs will come back for sure. It's just going to take a while. Don't waste that time because you can still build your skills and you can still find new positions at, at, at the end, for sure. Pedro, thank you very much for all the insights you brought us today. You have been uh, uh, an amazing alumnus of the school. You are a member of our strategic council. You have been a mentor of many of our students throughout the years in this mentoring program that I mentioned. And you are an inspiration for, for many people in the way that you manage your career and your personal life and uh, also your work on diversity and inclusion. Uh, so thank you for all that you do. Uh, and thank you thank for you. sharing this hour with us, with your stories, with your inspiration and your insights.